and I'm serving as tribute for the 2015 biology class. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so uh, right here, uh, we have a spotted eagle ray swimming through the ocean. Underneath him, uh, you see a jack crevel. And these two work in a symbiosis or a mutualistic relationship, and the spotted eagle ray has really powerful jaws, which he uses to dig through the sand to find conchs and other uh, shellfish and crack them open. Uh, the Jack Ravel swims right underneath him and picks up any of the scraps left behind, uh, as well as small fish that might swim out of the sand as the uh, spotted eagle ray is digging. This is just one of the many examples of symbiosis on coral reefs. They generally, everyone's kind of pitching in for a goal of making it through. So this is another example. This is an L5 shrimp, uh, the shrimp there on the left, or the right. And on the left, we have the sharp-eyed go boy. So the shrimp is completely blind, but he digs burrows in the sand, while the fish on the left uh, watches for predators. So when a predator comes along, the fish alerts the shrimp, and they both escape down into a burrow. Uh, this is a decorator crab, and he's covered in living plants. So what he does is he finds these brightly colored plants, and he puts them all over his back. This particular example is covered in uh, colorful sponges, sea anemones, and uh, bits of green algae. So the crab gets a free form of camouflage on the bottom of coral reefs, and the plants get a free form of transportation. And this is the type of symbiosis we're talking about today. This is me swimming on the uh, Florida Barrier Reef in the Florida Keys, and I'm surrounded by living coral. So you see that the coral has a lot of color, and that's because it lives in a mutualistic relationship with green algae. Uh, zoanthi is the kind of algae that lives inside coral. So they're primary producers uh, that <clears throat> produce the uh, oxygen, lipids, and sugars that the coral needs. And the coral is an animal, meaning it, produce, or it undergoes cellular respiration and provides carbon dioxide and water for the uh, primary producers living within it. So when primary production doesn't go as planned, basically what happens is the coral tells the algae, you didn't pay your rent, you have to get out. And that causes coral bleaching. So the all white coral that we see here is coral that's kicked its algae out. So the algae wasn't doing its job, so the coral rejected the algae, the algae died, and the coral can go on living for a little while, but not too much longer because it doesn't have an energy source. So this is a common trend we've been seeing around the globe for about the last 40 years. This is data published by the Global Reef Health Network in 2014. And if you see the green triangles up there by Bermuda, those are reefs that have been doing very well over the last 40 years. They've stayed at uh, high percentages of coral cover. The orange circles saw a, a drastic decline in live coral cover in the 70s and 80s, but since then have been doing pretty much the same, but at low levels of coral cover. And the blue squares are reefs that have uh, steadily been declining since the 70s and 80s in percentages of live coral cover. So what's going on here? There doesn't seem to be a pervasive force that's causing all of the coral to decline at, a, or at the same rate, like something such as global warming uh, might predict. So this is one of the things that Jacob Algier, the uh, lead researcher on the article we're going to be looking at, was concerned with. He wanted to know what is another hypothesis. What could be causing uh, the disparity in different coral reef populations? So he published an article in Ecology in 2013 uh, titled Consumers Regulate Nutrient Limitation Regimes in Primary Production in Seagrass Ecosystems. His hypothesis was that, was that fish through nutrient excretion enhance primary production and alter, alter nutrient limitation regimes of two primary producer groups, seagrass and benthic algae. So what he's proposing here is a system of bottom-up control. And what that means is there's a pool of nutrients at the bottom of the ecosystem. That pool of nutrients is uh, controlling how much production is going on at the primary production level. In turn, this regulates how, much, uh, how many nutrients go to the next level of primary consumers. These are the herbivores feeding on the primary producers. And in turn, to the next level of consumers feeding on the herbivores. So in ecosystems where nutrients are extremely limited, 
primary production is in turn limited, and the trophic levels above them are also limited. So when nutrient concentrations do not match the requirements of photosynthetic organisms, primary production is reduced. And that was one of the things that Algier wanted to look at. And he also wanted to look at how nutrients from these levels cycle back down into the producer level and cause an increase in production. He did this through five steps. The first of those steps was to construct artificial reefs. So one of the troubles of studying coral reefs is that there's extremely limited interactability. Uh, so what he did was took advantage of this concept. So you see on the left, we have a really busy city. And if we all think about what we know cities for, besides cities like only in New York, but if we think a little bit bigger, <laughs> maybe in terms of New York City or something, they're huge metropolitan areas where people go to work, they go out to dinner, uh, they go for entertainment, things like that. But for the most part, at night, uh, many people retreat back to the suburbs where they raise their families and go on with day-to-day -day life activities. There's a similar relationship between coral reefs and seagrass beds. So a lot of the fish that hang out on coral reefs also cycle nutrients back to seagrass beds. It's a lot of the same fish, the same consumers that are cycling nutrients back and forth. So Algier took advantage of this and he constructed artificial reefs on seagrass beds. Uh, so what this gives us is if you can modify the habitat structure to vary uh, consumer densities, you create a gradient of consumer nutrient supply to primary production. So he took advantage of this concept. A, we have a control group, which there was uh, no artificial reefs. B is his small reef, which consisted of uh, 10 cinder blocks, which he formed into a pyramid structure to kind of resemble a uh, coral reef structure. And C was uh, his large reef, which consisted of 40 cinder blocks and a pyramid structure. He had five controls, uh, five small reefs, and 10 large reefs. And so the first and most important concept he had to examine was, was there a gradient of consumers across his reefs? And that was his first finding. That was his larger reefs did have a larger biomass. Um, so what this is telling him is that he now has a gradient of nutrient supply that he can study uh, primary production across. Uh, this, he had a p-value here of less than 0 0.001. And so this means that there was a difference between his uh, three groups here, his three control, small, and large reefs. So the next part that gets a little tricky at times is the uh, bioenergetics models he constructed. So he did this using uh, parameters of natural history, so that's uh, feeding and diet uh, history, physiology, which is stoichiometry, predator and prey, uh, consumer, the prey density, things like that, and that <coughs> environment, which was temperature. <coughs> and he ran his models for 13 families of fish that he found living on his reefs. And uh, one of the families was broken down into genre because there was enough data to do so. That was the uh, family of snappers, which we have here. Um, and so what he was trying to find was excretion rate. So the first thing he did was took a survey of the fish on his reef. So that's actually Algier right here, taking a survey of the fish on his reef. And he did this uh, 20 times. And he would just go underwater and he would count all the fish that existed on his reef. Uh, he claimed that it normally took between one and three minutes. And he was surveying for species identity and length. Then, using historic data, he converted this length to biomass using linear, regress re linear regressions. So he had regression set up so that he, when he had the length of a fish of a certain species, it would tell him what the biomass was. Uh, he then used another linear regression of biomass versus excretion rate, and this excretion rate is coming from the uh, bioenergetics models that we just <coughs> talked about in the last slide, uh, to find uh, nitrogen and phosphorus excretion for each of the fish that were living on this reef. He then summed all the excretion for the fish that were on his reef for a particular day, and uh, reported excretion rates in nitrogen or phosphorus per reef per day. Uh, the next thing he was able to do was observational tests on his reefs. The first thing he wanted to study was seagrass growth, uh, and he measured this via a hole punch method. So he set up uh, nine stakes around each of his reefs. Uh, they're two to three meters away, and two to five seagrass blades 
depending on how much seagrass growth there was, uh, were punched with an uh, 18 gauge needle right at the base of the oldest leaf. And he let them grow for 10 days and then he went back, collected all the samples that he had punctured, measured how far they had grown in that 10 days, as well as analyzed them for the nutrient content in that growth period. Uh, this is what he found. Most of it is pretty intuitive, I think, but he had to support his findings with data. So across the y-axis, we see seagrass growth. So that is how many millimeters squared per day the seagrass grew over those 10 days, from the hole punching to when he collected his seagrass. Uh, across the x-axis, we have nitrogen supply in grams per day. So this is how much the fish were excreting uh, of nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, if you look inside the graph, you see the orange, or the, the circles here. Uh, they represent his control reefs, so there was no artificial reefs present. The triangles represent his medium sized or small reefs, so there was 10 cinder blocks. And the squares represent his large reefs with 40 cinder blocks. And so the first thing we can look at here is that this is a visual representation that nutrient supply was increasing from his control to small to large reefs. And we see that as well on the phosphorus supply, uh, this control, small, and large reefs. But what we're looking at here is did seagrass growth increase across these uh, nutrient gradients? And what he found was that there was a positive correlation between nitrogen supply and seagrass growth. This line here is a linear regression, and our R squared value is telling us how close each of these points fall to the line. So if our R squared value is 1, every point would be touching the line. Um, our R squared value is not really anywhere near 1, but our P value is telling us that there's still a relationship between our uh, predictor, predictor values and what we found. The same concept is going on with the phosphorus supply. We have an R squared value that is relatively low, but our P value is still suggesting that the relationship does exist. There is a uh, good chance that there's a positive correlation between increased nitrogen and phosphorus supply and seagrass growth. This was his next test, where to uh, examine how much nutrient content the seagrass actually took in. And this was to establish, uh, just to reaffir reaffirm his data that he found in the last experiment. So seagrass growth, or seagrass as percent nitrogen, that's how much nitrogen existed in the seagrass, seagrass blades. And he found, once again, another positive correlation. If there was more nitrogen uh, supplied by the fish, then there was more nitrogen in the seagrass blades. Uh, once again, it's a positive correlation across the nitrogen supply and the phosphorus supply. This is just summing up what it, basically what I just said. So this is a little bit more complicated, but it's still really not too bad. So phosphorus supply is increasing across the x-axis, and the N to P molar ratio is increasing across the y-axis. So N to P molar ratio is important because it's going to tell us how much of each nutrient the seagrass is using. So we see a negative correlation here. So as the phosphorus supply is increasing, the N to P molar concentration, so nitrogen to phosphorus, is decreasing, meaning that it's taking in the phosphorus faster than it's taking in the nitrogen. So phosphorus supplied by fish decreased the N to P molar ratio. And why is this important? This is where we have to bring in uh, the concept of red field ratios. So historic data uh, has presented that the red field ratio is 30 to 1 for optimum seagrass growth, which means that they are incorporating, incorporating 30 times as much nitrogen as phosphorus into their biomass. Uh, the control groups here are implying a P limitation because as we increase the phosphorus, the uh, ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus is decreasing, and uh, at the highest levels of phosphorus supply, they're starting to reach that 30 to 1 mark, which is where we saw on the previous figures was the highest growth. The phosphorus is reduced by fish nutrient excretion, and this is most likely because fish excrete nutrients at a low nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Uh, Al here next went on to manipulate some of the variables on his reef to see what effect they would have. 
He did this using nutrient diffusing substrates. So he was studying benthic algae in this case, so the algae that was growing along the bottom of his seagrass beds. And he did this based on uh, using nutrient auger plates. He had three treatment groups. One contained a uh, nitrogen-containing compound, one contained phosphorus, and one contained both. He also had a control group, uh, which was, did not contain any of these nutrients. He attached the three, the four plates to a PVC bar, and he staked them half a meter from his reef, and he collected them 21 days later. So how he analyzed this data was that the treatment with the highest value of chlorophyll A uh, per surface area should contain the most limiting <coughs> nutrient. So this is uh, a concept we've all explored um, in Bio 105 lab when we used uh, chlorophyll A as a predictor of photosynthesis, and it was the same idea. So along the y-axis is the amount of chlorophyll A present, and this was measured using spectrometry. So uh, the more chlorophyll A there was, the more photosynthetic, photosynthetic activity was going on. And the x-axis is similar to what we've seen before with increasing nitrogen and phosphorus supplies. Um, what we see here is a positive correlation between increased nitrogen supply and the amount of chlorophyll A present on the reefs. So uh, just important to remember that these along the bottom are the fish excretion rates, and there's no additional nutrients being provided by the agroplates at this time. Uh, the same thing we see on the right with phosphorus mm -hmm. supply and uh, chlorophyll A production. So this is when uh, he evaluated one of his treatment groups, which is when he provided phosphorus on one of the agar plates to study. Uh, so as nitrogen supply increased, there was a positive correlation between uh, chlorophyll A, especially when there was phosphorus as a treatment group. So what's important that we see here is that there was not a significant relationship when there was nitrogen supply to the benthic algae or when there's nitrogen and phosphorus supplied to the benthic algae. So what this implies is that the fish were producing enough nitrogen uh, for excess phosphorus to have an effect. So if there was no nutrients in the water, you would expect the additional supply of nitrogen or phosphorus to have an effect on production. If there was excess of both nutrients in the water, you would expect either or any of the treatments to have an effect on the amount of chlorophyll A produced. But since we only have one, we well, let's say, but since we only have one there, that implies that phosphorus may be a limiting nutrient. The final thing he wanted to uh, analyze was the role of community structure. So he split. Uh, his functional feeding groups into the two most dominant ones that he found on his reef. So herbivores, like this parrotfish here, uh, were those who consumed more than 90% plant, plant diet. His second most dominant uh, feeding group was mesopredators, which he included omnivores with greater than a 90% diet. Uh, this is a grunt, one of the most common fish found on his reef. <coughs> and here we see along the x-axis, herbivores and predators. The piece for predators actually stands for mesopredators, but they use the P just for simplicity. Um, and across the y-axis, you see N to P molar excretion. And what's important here to notice is that the functional feeding groups are excreting nutrients at much uh, different ratios. So the herbivores are excreting nutrients at a much higher nitrogen to phosphorus molar ratio, and uh, mesopredators are excreting nutrients <coughs> at a much uh, lower nitrogen to phosphorus ratio. Next, he uh, looked at this compared to biomass. So herbivores, you can see, make up very little of the biomass here. We're looking at the proportion of the total for each of the nutrients and for the biomass. So if you look at biomass first, you see that herbivores, compared to the total amount of fish present, make up a very little, small percentage, while predator, or mesopredators make up a majority of it. Uh, nitrogen, compared to biomass, uh, they contribute more nitrogen compared to the biomass, and predators are excreting more phosphorus compared to biomass. So one of the things that was really interesting about reading this paper is we got to see 
all the fun you can have in field ecology. So one of the first interesting parts of this paper is that one of their 40 blocks briefs was stolen. But one of their 40 block briefs was stolen off the reef, so they had to use 19 groups instead of 20. Uh, five NDS treatments were lost during transportation. It was lucky that it was pretty much one from each treatment group. They didn't really say how they were lost, but they were. Uh, they had to vary the length of trials for seagrass growth and benthic algae growth because of uh, Hurricane Irene. And one of the other things that they had to uh, mention in their discussion that might have had an effect was that they may have underestimated nutrients and overestimated the fish populations. So fish digestion, which was that, there was, there was nutrients taken in by the fish but not digested, just egested, were not accounted for in the models. And also some fish were migrating from the reefs at night and all the surveys were taken during the day. So this means that while they, uh, while they assumed in their models that all the fish were excreting nutrients on these reefs all day and all night, uh, in reality, many of them were migrating away from the artificial reefs at night. So our findings. They found a positive correlation between fish nutrient supply rates and seagrass growth rates and nutrient content. We found a P limitation of benthic algae may be influenced by the consumers. The consumers may be reducing the effect of the P limitation. There is a clear distinction of the ratio at which different functional feeding groups were excreting nutrients. Uh, so the big picture, consumers were influencing primary production and there was an importance in linking individual population and community to nutrient supply. And there was also a need to emphasize bottom-up dynamics as another critical reason for animal conservation. So we're back to the map. And we're wondering what's going on with the map. Why do we bring up the map? Well, if we look at places where the reefs are doing fairly well, like in Bonaire, uh, there's 301 people per kilometer squared. And there's greater than 37% live coral cover. If we look at places like the upper Florida Keys, where I spent most of my summer, there's greater than 25,000 people per kilometer squared and less than 6% live coral cover. <coughs> So the difference there, suggested by El here, and also something I witnessed in my own personal experience, is the amount of fishing and overfishing that's going on. Uh, humans are selectively removing the top predators and top functional feeding groups by going for huge trophy fish or just taking as many of the biggest fish as they can, which is really altering the nutrient uh, dynamics within these ecosystems. So future research in this topic is going to include the relationship between human population and reef, reef health. So while the Global Reef Monitoring Network has made the connection between the amount of humans that are around and how well the coral is doing, they don't know if this is because of uh, waste runoff or fertilizer from golf courses or overfishing or population. There's a lot of different influences that can have an effect here. Uh, we also know that iron and silicon, as well as nitrogen and phosphorus, are crucial for primary production. So the roles of consumers and th things that are going to cycle these nutrients are also necessary to study. And lastly, the design of protected areas. So most of the protected <coughs> coral reefs in the Earth right now are huge spanning regions of coral reefs that are protected. But there's certain places in the world where they're trying new designs like pearls on a string. So they're little tiny protected areas where the fish can cycle back and forth and move the nutrients back and forth. And so the predator groups, the predator and prey relationships, as well as community dynamics, can kind of balance themselves out under these t smaller protection areas versus the large ones. Also, if there's something like a natural disaster or an oil spill, an entire protected area can be wiped out. So uh, to see where this pearl on a string method of protected areas goes is going to be interesting for the future. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to my advisor, uh, Dr. Dora Jan, my junior son advisor, Dr. Mitchell, who can no longer be with us, uh, the faculty and staff who have uh, helped me get this far, and my classmates, teammates, and roommates. Thank you.